to welcome the homeward bounder on the day of his return. Make the dockyard cranes a looming with the distant siren booming while the dockyard made his scurry to take his life. Uh, my name is um, Anne Reader and I bought some memorabilia in from my late father's um, experiences in the um, during the war. He was a, um, a first class radio officer trained by, by Marconi and um, I thought it might, would be of interest. That's my father, Pat, Patrick McCarthy. Well, um, what happened, it was a cargo ship and it was torpedoed and um, obviously started fires on board. The captain went off in, the life, in a lifeboat with some of the crew and left my father behind with some other members of the crew and they managed to save the ship. They put the fire, fires out. He's holding a hose pipe with, and there's the flames. And they managed to get the ship into dock somewhere. So, in, so effectively, my, my father and a handful of other um, crew saved the ship. The captain and all the others that were in the lifeboat, they were all lost at sea, which was ironic. Yeah. So the um, the radio officers' union that that he, they all belonged to, uh, he belonged to, said they should apply for salvage because a, a ship is worth a lot of money. It's a, a very valuable commodity. And so there was a court case to to um, to, to to try, you know. To, um, and this is a, um, a copy of all the court case and all the questions they asked it, asked the members of the crew. How could he afford to be represented? Well, I suppose the, the union, the, probably, the union probably helped. The Albionic, pleadings and agreement of values, statement of claim. The plaintiff claims remuneration for salvage services rendered to the Albionic her cargo and freight in the Bristol Channel on the 19th, 20th and the 21st of March 1940 in the circumstances hereinafter appearing. The Albionic is a steel screw steamship of 2,468 tonnes, gross 290 feet in length. The Albionic left Barry on the 18th of March 1940 and the plaintiff sailed on board her as wireless t telegraph operator. About 2.50 a.m. on the 19th of March, the plaintiff was called out to his station as the ship was on fire. The plaintiff reported to the master and was instructed to send out an SOS. Given the position of the ship, the Albionic, was then about 12 miles off Heartland Point and was badly on fire amidships with flames rising to the top of the funnel and the boat deck on fire. The engines were still working ahead as it had been impossible to, still, impossible to shut off steam and the rudder had jammed halfway over to port so that the Albionic was going round in circles. Shortly afterwards, the master and 12 other members of the crew abandoned the ship in the two lifeboats, leaving the plaintiff, the chief and second officers, the chief engineer and eight other members of the crew on board the Albionic. The weather at this time was very bad, with strong southerly wind and rough sea and there was heavy s s rain squ squalls. As the Albionic Circle's path passed close to the boat in which the master was. He hailed those on board the Albionic to jump overboard, saying that he would pick them up. In the meantime, the chief officer had organised a bucket party in order to prevent the fire from spreading, and the plaintiff took his part in this work. All the water had to be drawn up from the overside as no pumps were working. 
the plaintiff also sent out a second SOS message on the instructions of the chief head officer. About 3.45 a.m., the engine stopped owing to lack of steam, and shortly afterwards, as the Albionic was driving dangerously close to Lundy Island, the chief officer decided to try to anchor the vessel to prevent her driving ashore. The anchors were successfully let go and cables were veered to 105 fathoms. About the same time, the Clovelly lifeboat came out on the scene and offered to take off the remaining members of the crew. The, the chief officer informed the crew that anyone who wished could leave the ship. And as it appeared that there were, there were some who were minded to do so, the plaintiff went down onto the foredeck and urged them to stand by the ship in order to save her, if possible. As a result of the plaintiff's efforts, all the crew remained on board. At about 9.30 a.m., the fire had subsided and had been prevented from spreading as a result of the con continued efforts of those on board with the buckets. The plaintiff then sent out a message on the orders of the chief officer to the Admiralty to the Admiral at Plymouth to the effect that if two tugs and a salvage vessel were sent, it might be possible to bring the Albionic into safety. During the forenoon, the plaintiff with other members of the crew got two ropes ready and also assisted in rigging the hand, gearing, hand steering gear. All the ropes had to be manhandled as there was no steam. During the afternoon, the second officer with other members of the crew cut through both anchor chains, cables, in the chain locker so as to be ready to slip the anchors when tugs arrived. This work was completed about 10 p.m. and the chains had to be cut with hammer and chisels. About 7, 7 p.m. the preserver and the Brockenhurst arrived but it was too dark to do anything. The two berth vessels stood by during the night and the plaintiff with the second officer remained on watch all night in order to deal with any outbreaks of, outbreaks of fire. During the night, outbreaks of fire were extinguished by the plaintiff and the second officer. About 7 a.m. on the 20th of March, the preserver and the Brockenhurst were made fast forward and about 7.30 a.m. when the Albionic was safely held by these two vessels. The anchors were buoyed and slipped and the towage began. The plaintiff assisted in making the tugs fast. There was a strong to, there was a fresh to strong wind from the southwest with the rough sea. The chief officer went to the wheel, but at times it needed three men to hold the wheel. During the tow, the preserver repeatedly parted her ropes her rope. On each occasion the crew of the Albionic had to go forward in order to make fast again. The plaintiff assisted in handling the ropes. Eventually the preserver was made fast aft to assist in steering the vessel. About 3 a.m. on the 21st of March 1940, the Albionic arrived at Swansea and was safely berthed about 8.30 a.m. By reason of the said services, the Albionic and her crew were rescued from a position of great peril and brought into safety. The Albionic was badly on fire amidships and for the efforts of those on board her, including the plaintiff, there was great danger of the fire spreading rapidly and the vessel and her crew becoming a total loss. The master and 12 members of the crew had abandoned the ship and only 12 men were left aboard. Even after the fire had been controlled, there was serious risk of the Albionic driving ashore and being lost with the cargo or at least being very seriously damaged. In rendering the said services, the plaintiff ran considerable risks. The fire had a good hold and there was no means of leaving the vessel except in the, the Crivelli lifeboat. The work of handing the ropes was heavy and arduous and the plaintiff played an important part in maintaining a watch on the fire during the night of the 19th to 20th of March. During the said services, the plaintiff had little or no sleep, and at the end of them were almost exhausted. 
the examples set by the plaintiff and his courage and initiative were largely instrumental in deciding the remainder of the crew in, in sorry in in deciding the start again oh sorry the courage the example set by the plaintiff and his courage and initiative were largely instrumental in deciding the, the remainder of the crew to stand by the vessel and contributing greatly to the ultimate success of the salvage operations. The plaintiff claims such an amount of salvage as to the court may seem meet. Delivered this 13th day of, of January 1941 by Ingle Joe Brown, Van Benison and Garrett of 136 Minories, London, agents for Messrs Lean and Lean of Cardiff, plaintiff's solicitors. And it's signed by Owen J. B Batesman. What a testimony to your father's bravery. Are you hugely proud of him? Of course I am, of course I am, very proud, yes. And were these documents discovered after his death, or did you know about his bravery? Well, he he he, he didn't talk a lot about it. Um, like a lot of men in that have been through the the war, they kept a lot of it to themselves. But it it gradually came out. Um, but I knew, I knew, you know, that what had happened on the up because we had this picture in our house all the time because someone had drawn it of him. Your father was laid off during the depression between the wars, but he volunteered when the war started yes. and put himself back in the frying pan, if not the fire. Yes. What was he involved in? Well, he was, uh, uh, I've just told you about this, but also later on, he was involved in the invasion of Sicily. And I'm 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 sorry, but I've, I'm I'm a bit vague about the dates and everything. I don't know the dates. Um, but all I know is the ship was um, a sitting duck because it was full of ammunition, and they were being bombed by the Germans because they were bringing ammunition out for the army. And um, it was so they had uh, Nazi Luftwaffe planes flying yeah, over them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, to be honest. Um, it was it was absolutely horrendous, and um, um, and he did actually he did actually collapse on deck, um, and I think he had to be taken to hospital. Are we talking about fear, fright, or wounding, or both? No, I think it was just the pressure of it all and everything. Well, he's shown his bravery; he didn't have to yeah, yeah, prove yeah. nothing. Yeah, that's right. So um, I think he was in a hospital in Italy. Um, but, um, yeah, so, I mean, you know, there's odd stories that he it would come out, you know. Um, um, I remember on another occasion he was torpedoed. I remember on another occasion he was torpedoed and they were in an open boat. And, in a, and they couldn't save the ship then, you know, it was too bad. And... Um, and he was on this open boat for a long, long time. I don't know. I don't know the, any of the details. All I know is that they they brought them into um, back to the UK, and they they were um, taken to the north of England in Scotland somewhere. And um, and when the torpedo struck the ship, they were all in bed. And so they only had like their, what, their, 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 what they wore at night in bed, pajamas and stuff. And um, and then they were told when they were taken, dropped off in in the north of England somewhere, Scotland or so wherever it was, they were told to go home. And they were given a railway pass and just told to go home. I mean, it, it was. <laughs> and my mother received a communication to say that he was missing, presumed dead. And she said that she was, um, and I was a baby, and she had me in, a, in her arms, and um, she was looking out of the window, and she saw this tramp walking up the road. And um, because he, you know, and it was my father, he'd come home. 
and she thought he was dead. <laughs> you know, and all these, uh, all these things. I mean, the family suffer along with the men, don't they? Yeah. What an emotional scene that must yeah, have been. Yeah, absolutely. I bet thought, a few tears flowed. Yeah, absolutely, yes. And um, Because she thought he was dead. missing, presumed dead. Yeah, yeah. And there he is. Suddenly yeah. she recognised him. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, so, um, but there was no, um, they didn't sort of wrap them in cotton wool when they were dropped off. You know, they just had to get on with it. <laughs> no psychiatrists no, or psychologists. No, no, They were given... Um, a railway pass and told to go home. Did he ever go to sea again? Was that the, was that he'd oh, had no, he had enough? Oh no, he 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 stayed through the war. He stayed at the sea, and um, um, and then after the war, he continued being a radio officer, and he didn't retire until about the nineteen sixties. He was a first class radio yes, officer. Yes. How did that separate them from a second class radio officer? Well, I think uh, from memory. I remember when I was growing up, um, of course, in when he was trained, going back, you know, it was like 19, 1920 or so, or even before that, there was no such thing as radar. And in order to become a first class radio officer, he had to be um, trained in to use radar. So they paid for him to do a course on radar. And I remember him doing his homework at home and he, he couldn't become a first class radio officer unless he had this qualification for radar as well. So that, so he did that. And so he became a first class radio officer. He was also, um, after the war, he was on a ship called the Kampala. Um, and it sailed from East Africa across to India. And it kept doing that route. It was a, a, a cruise ship. And it was, it was, I believe the Queen, um, they, they used, the Queen used it at some stage, but it, it wasn't when he was on it, but, but, but I believe she was, before they had um, Britannia built, I believe she was, she went, she sailed on the Kampala. Um, but Would you have bumped into her? No, no, because this was prior to him working on it you know but he was on the compiler for about three years well longer. for his bravery I do hope they gave him the royal bedroom yes yes that I'm sure yes that would have been marvelous wouldn't it that's right but like most lot of men in the war they didn't brag about it did they did he pick up any medals at all oh yes he, I, I, I've, I've got medals at home but you know um, I didn't bring them today yes yeah, so um Yes, I mean, he'd, he'd certainly done his bit. He needn't have volunteered to go back in during the war, but he did. And, um, um, you know, he just got on with it, really. Would he have been too old to have signed up for the forces? I married my mother in 1939. Um, and so he would have been 40 then. He would have been 40. Probably then. too old to serve in the forces, but good enough yeah, with his yeah. training. Yeah, it would have been silly not to have used his expertise, wouldn't they? You know, um, um, and uh, and I was born in 1942. So, um, but then, of course, I saw very little of him because he was always away at sea. And, um, and he always used to say, he always used to say, this isn't a job for a married man because it, he felt it very cutely, you know, leaving my mother and myself. But he stuck it out until he retired. Um, he became um, profoundly deaf towards the end, which was very sad. All the explosions, yes. no doubt. He was in, he was in the water and there were high explosives in the water and it produced and it had a terrible effect on his ears and of course that was his livelihood wasn't it his ears you see and um, Marconi's kept him on he became profoundly deaf and um, but they kept him on but they decided that they should downgrade him to become a second class, uh, class radio officer because um, you know, they thought that was the thing to do. It put less pressure on him. So he continued until he was 65. 
So he must have retired. He was born in 1899. So he must have retired about 1964. So, you know, so, um, yes, it would have been 1964. So there you go. You've heard the, my father's side of the story and the hearing was heard and um, um, and I'm afraid they didn't get salvage. It was, it was dismissed, which is very sad because it would have made a big difference to them, him and the other members of the crew. It was probably deemed to be something that happens in the war. Yes. That's what I. That's what I think. If this had happened yeah. in peacetime, yes, my goodness, he would have had it. Yes, abandoned by the yeah. captain, yeah. who died, and the crew members who went in the two lifeboats were never seen again. That's right. And um, so, um, no, I mean, it, it's a shame, but there you go. I suppose it, life is cheap during the war, isn't it? That's the trouble. Yeah. Anyway. But you've got some wonderful, wonderful memories here. All these others are his uh, books of service. He, he had an honourable discharge, as it were, yes, yes. Uh, in retirement. And yes. uh, you've even got a, a... Why have you got that um, Marconi uh, booklet there? Please tell me about that, because we're at well, the birthplace of wireless yeah. radio Marconi here. Marconi Veterans Register. Was he a, a Marconi veteran? Was he on the register? I suppose he must have been. Could you find his name, oh, please? Oh, well, there's so many names. Is it alphabetical order? No, I don't think so. I think that, that it, it depends on the year that... that um, okay. I, I'd need to spend time going yes. through it, really. What would you like to do with this collection? Are you going to keep it in the family? Well, I'd, I'd, I, I really hadn't thought about it, really. I mean, what sparked it off was seeing that you were having the Marconi exhibition at Hall Street. And so I came along a few weeks ago, and then they asked me if I'd got any memorabilia, which is why I'm here today. To them he is no stranger in the cruel North Atlantic. He's seen men and ships go down. But now there's wives and sweethearts waiting And they'll soon be celebrating A Jack is home from sea And he has left the killing grounds And as he walks the streets of Liverpool Cardiff Hall and London Town He'll pass a million people there And some of them may frown For he doesn't wear a uniform it tells you what he's done. He's just the merchant seaman that we all depend upon. All too soon his short time's over, and he must sail again. And there's tears among his loved ones on all the risks he runs. For he must run that you both gauntlet as he has done before. Where thousands of his shipmates sleep on that dark ocean floor. But there's a bloody battle raging on the cold Atlantic foam. And one in every four like him will not be coming home. For he's been through hell and danger. To them he is no stranger. In the cruel North Atlantic he's seen men and ships go down. And for the wives and sweethearts waiting, there can be no celebrating till Jack is home from sea again and leaves the killing ground. He come from Bristol and Southampton, Yarmouth and Swansea town, from the Humber and from Townside, wherever ships are found. And he sails in tramps and tankers, in freighters old and new, in liners and in coasters, in tugs and trawlers too. And he sails on every ocean, and he braves the raging sea to keep our lifelines open and to keep this country free. And he sails through hell and danger, to them he is no stranger, from the Arctic to Pacific, He's seen men and ships go down, and for the wives and sweethearts waiting, 
There'll be no celebrating till Jack is home from sea again and leaves the killing ground. And if you go to Liverpool, Yarmouth or London town, you'll meet him in the dockside pubs where sailors hang around. But he doesn't wear a uniform that tells you what he's done. He's just the merchant seaman that we all depend upon. He's the British merchant seaman that we can depend upon.